So special welcome to you, each and everyone, for refreshing Sunday evening talk. Brother Charles from Sydney, Australia. So let's welcome once again, Brother Charles. So he is the national coordinator and the chairperson for the board of directors also. And he is practicing this spiritual path with Brahma Kumaris for past five decades. So such a beautiful, experienced personality we have this evening. And uh, he visited all the continents, uh, let's say more than 80 countries, and frequent traveler all the time. He is on the air in some or the other part of the world, serving the souls, spreading his fragrance of spirituality, and uplifting everyone's soul and to experience the reality of life and to face the challenges with more grace and happiness. So today we have the fortune to have you also and beautiful topic, managing our powerful emotions, which is very much relevant for everyone in today's world. So let's have uh, or take that wisdom from Brother Charlie, how to manage our emotions deal with our powerful emotions thank you and let's enjoy charlie bye this evening good evening everyone it's really such a great pleasure to be with you tonight and um, i've been in hyderabad just for three days which has been extremely lovely I'm not exactly sure, but I think I've visited India on at least 100 occasions, but it's only my second time in Hyderabad. <laughs> but it's really been <clears throat> very lovely to be here, and I've had the fortune of staying in this beautiful campus, which is quite extraordinary. So what I'd love to do tonight is just share a few of my thoughts, and there'll be time for some questions. And as you know, we always will have some finish with some experience of meditation. We live in an extraordinary world. <coughs> Eight billion human beings, 195 countries, 6,500 spoken languages, and 4,500 practiced religions. It's incredible, isn't it? But I think seeing our world, sometimes we feel there's so much change, there's so much upheaval in our world, there's so much uncertainty everywhere. And for most, relationships are extremely challenging and difficult these days. So where does all this land? Where does it all land inside me? It lands in my emotions and my feelings. And I think for most of us, Life is this incredible emotional roller coaster, sometimes feeling very high, sometimes feeling very strong, sometimes feeling extremely low and vulnerable. And as Sister Vasanta was saying, I, <clears throat> I grew up in Melbourne, but I live in Sydney. And I used to teach meditation at the main jail in Sydney. And once I was going along to teach the meditation, and they asked me to do it in a special prison. They actually created this special prison to encourage prisoners to behave better. So if they behaved well, they got points. And the more points, they got privileges. They got privileges within the prison. If they didn't behave well, they lost points and they went back into the main prison. So when I went along, I was invited to teach meditation to this group. So I went along and Every prisoner in this prison came for meditation. And I was so happy. I thought, wow, they're so interested in meditation. But then I found out they got points for coming. So the real motive was <laughs> to, get their <laughs> to get their points. <clears throat> but what I remember, one man, he stood up. He was very articulate, very well spoken. And he said he was really <coughs> emotional, I would say. He just said, what can I do with my powerful emotions? When I get angry, I lose all self-control. 
I don't even know what I'm doing, and twice I've killed people. And he said, it's ruined my life, and of course it's ruined other people's lives too. I think we all have powerful emotions, maybe not quite as powerful as that person. But really there's two types. There's the explosive emotions that are very visible. These are the things like anger and aggression. But the majority of emotion is implosive or invisible, like fear, grief, hurt, depression. All these emotions, really, often people don't know when we're going through those feelings. And probably the most visible of all emotions is anger. And honestly, this is just one out of a whole spectrum of emotion. But if you really look in a sort of a really a detached perspective, anger has a massive influence on the quality of my life. First of all, on my relationships, when I'm angry, you know, when you really get verbally angry, <coughs> you know, the founder of the Brahma Kumaris, Brahma Baba, used to say, get angry once, it'll affect your life for six months or more. Because it's like everyone has a little digital camera in their mind. And if I'm screaming and yelling, go click, 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 and you record that image. And every time that person comes in front of you, sometimes not just months, for years, you're thinking, are they going to get angry again? So carelessness of just a second, letting my emotion take over, influences my life and my relationships, I would say, for months or even years. So that's the gross form of anger. And then we can say there's like a subtle form of anger where I don't verbally show it, but you know when you feel irritated, frustrated, annoyed, you may hold it inside. Often we feel other people don't know. But in fact, everything in your mind people feel. Once in Australia, I was working with a group of actors and a man came to speak to them that when acting is about communication, whenever you're acting, you're communicating with an audience. And this person was saying that when you communicate, <coughs> you communicate on three levels. One is verbal, what you say. The second two are nonverbal, your face, like your body language, and your vibrations. And what he was saying is 80 to 90% of the impact of any communication, any connection with another person is nonverbal. So when people get two messages, one is what they hear and one is what they feel, they always trust their feelings. So even though I may not say anything, but in my mind I'm having a lot of irritation, annoyance, people feel it and there's a distance between my heart. So anger is a gross form, a subtle form, even a refined form of anger is avoiding another human being. If I avoid another human being and don't speak to them, that's also a form of anger. <coughs> so anger has a massive effect on my relationships, which is really the beauty of life. But secondly, on my health, and you know there's a, there's a medical research in the UK and this person says that when we let go anger in the form of a grudge, it can relieve back pain. <coughs> I find that incredible. I don't know whether that's proven research, but, you know, because we all know the psychosomatic nature of the mind. Whatever emotion is here, it translates to my body. And there's so much research that when I'm regularly angry, I regularly lose my temper, it releases the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisone. They just rush through my system. My heart begins to palpitate. My breath, you know, goes like that. My mind begins to race. And when I'm regularly angry, that wears down the brain. There's cell atrophy. It wears down the brain cells. There is memory loss. The effect of anger long term is memory loss. Secondly, it, what it does when I'm regularly angry, it builds blood pressure, it builds blood sugar, it hardens arteries, it affects my heart. So investment in dealing with my anger 
is not just having better relationships, it's an investment in my health too. Even there's an incredible amount of research about the relationship of fear and the heart. <clears throat> if I was just, <coughs> or someone ran in this door now and said there's a, a fire in this building, I promise you they won't. <laughs> but if someone ran in and said there's a fire in this building, what's the first thing that happens before all of us run for that door? Boom, 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 you know? If every day, every day of my life, I have fear of a personality in my family, I have fear of my boss, I have fear that I won't be good enough in my work, I have fear that I might fail in something, that fear is constantly putting pressure on my heart. My heart is just a little pump. And so really when we begin to see that these emotions have a huge effect, not just on my relationships, even on my physical well-being as well, but mostly anger affects my relationships, anger affects my health, but mo mostly it affects my relationship with me. If you really look honestly in your heart, if you yell and scream or get angry with someone who you love, someone who's really close to you, someone who's caring for you, deep down, how do you feel about yourself? You don't really like yourself. And so this regular anger damages my relationship with myself, which is ultimately the most important relationship in life. Personally, I believe, why have we got this mad world? Why is this world so crazy wherever you go in the world? <coughs> Governments are throwing trillions of dollars at problems. I would say the seed problem is my relationship with me. When there's eight billion human souls with a dysfunctional relationship with themselves, I talk down at myself, I criticize myself, I'm negative towards myself, then this negativity, this negative emotion flows. Can you hear me okay still? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Someone was trying to sing us a song, I think. <laughs> so this negativity, this negative relationship with me flows into my health, flows into my family life, flows into the workplace, flows into institutions, and look at the world we have. The seed of it is this unhealthy relationship with me. So we begin to see just one emotion has a massive effect on the quality of my life. I would say in one way the whole spiritual journey is learning to deal with these powerful emotions not with force and control, but with love and wisdom. And I find it incredibly ironic that most of us are well-educated. We've all been to university. Did any of you do a course on managing your emotions, how to deal with powerful emotions? We ignore it. We're just supposed to learn. And so what do we do? We don't know what to do with them. So what strategies do we use? We suppress them. The first thing is often anger doesn't look nice, so I push it down. Hurt and grief, all these feelings, I don't show them. I push them down, I push them down. But they pop out somewhere with overreaction, feeling highly sensitive, <coughs> irritated. But there's a lot of research. The more I suppress my emotion, my health is affected. Many believe there's a lot of illness because of suppression. Not only do we suppress, but we deny to myself, because they don't look nice. If I'm very angry or negative, they don't look nice. So because I don't like them, I begin to deny them to myself. So people say, why are you up like this? And I say, no, I'm not. I don't even see who I am. You know, there's an extraordinary organization in the world called AA. You've probably heard of it, Alcoholics Anonymous, which d it deals with addiction. And there's a program, a 12-step program for people to deal not with just addiction to alcohol and things like that, but even to people. I become so dependent on people, etc. 
And you know the first step is to admit I have a problem. And many find that the hardest step to be that honest with myself, to say, yes, I am an angry person. Yes, this is my emotion and I take responsibility because when I begin to do that, I can begin to change. And as long as I deny it, then that I will not change. <coughs> so sometimes I suppress, sometimes I deny, because I don't know what to do with these powerful emotions. Sometimes I avoid people and situations that trigger those feelings, that make me so uncomfortable. So I design my life so that I don't come in front of these people or these situations that make me feel very uncomfortable and unhappy. Or well, sometimes I get on the front foot and I blame everybody else. Everyone else in the world is responsible for the way I feel. <laughs> and you know, spiritually, blame is considered the ultimate ignorance. The ultimate ignorance. In a sense, I'm giving the control of my emotions to you. And I'm saying, you behave in a certain way and I will be okay. But if you behave in this way, you are going to trigger my emotions. And it's disempowering myself because it's like I give my power to everybody else. You are responsible for the way I feel. Actually, in spirituality, the first law of spirituality says, I am responsible for how I feel. And so many times we suppress, sometimes we deny, sometimes we avoid, sometimes we blame. <coughs> so many different strategies actually we adopt to try and negotiate with these very powerful and uncomfortable feelings. But ultimately, I would say that the most important thing is to face them and bring change. And really, that's what spirituality is about. And for me, I would say the first step in dealing with powerful emotions is to understand them and take responsibility. Sometimes I think of emotions like a volcano. What's happening inside is frothing through, and they reach a point, the pressure comes and we explode. The end point of emotion is anger. But what's been f building up inside of me over weeks, months, years? Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes there's the fear that people will see through my facade. I'm not so confident. I'm not so, I don't have so much self-love. I'm not as good as I look. I have that fear. Sometimes there's a grief, a real grief inside that I haven't really, I've lost somewhere true love, the experience of true love. Sometimes there's hurt inside that I haven't really been loved and respected in the way I really feel. I should be. So these go inside, these boil inside of me. They boil up, boil up, and then they explode. Once I was in a country in South America called Costa Rica. It's a little country in Central America, and it's many volcanoes. And I walked up to the lip of a volcano. It's an active volcano. And I looked down, and it was amazing. It was frothing and bubbling, and it was really wild. And I could just feel it's like, the volcano builds pressure, builds pressure, builds pressure, then explosion. The anger is the end point. And this is why really, if I really want to deal with powerful emotions, I have to look at what is really underneath my anger. I have to be that honest. What is it that's really feeding it? Is it hurt? Is it fear? Is it grief? What is the feeling that's really making me feel this? And then adopt this law that I am responsible for how I feel. We live in a world which is challenging, isn't it? Let's be honest. <coughs> people will be rude. People will be difficult. People sometimes will insult you. But I always have a choice. I can react or I can have the choice not to react. Because actually, if I react, it's a choice I've made. It's a feeling I've created. And I feel that if I'm really serious, I have to own whatever I'm feeling inside. 
that I am responsible for my feelings. It's not the work, it's not the economy, it's not my family, it's not others. Yes, there's no doubt they trigger my feelings, but ultimately if I get angry, if I react, they are my feelings. Because only when I have the courage and the honesty to accept it can I begin to change. The second step is to really know myself. And I feel personally that these emotions are children of an unhealthy relationship of, with myself. In sociology, they know that when a husband and wife don't get on, it affects the children. If mum and dad are always fighting, it has effect on the children. Sometimes, <coughs> sometimes a lot, sometimes not so much. But it definitely has some effect. If I'm not getting on with myself, if I'm always putting myself down, criticizing myself, telling myself I'm no good, telling myself people think this about you, when I have this unhealthy relationship, it starts to give birth to these negative emotions. One of them is depression. And some years ago, I was on a speaking tour in Australia with a very well-to-do businessman who got completely depressed. And, you know, as he said, I have a good family. I was doing well in business. Everything was okay, but I felt completely unhappy. And he wrote a book, and he got many prominent people from business, from politics, from the arts, from academia to write their battle with depression. And you know what he was saying? That the World Health Organization says one in four people today is suffering from depression. Isn't that incredible? It's like an, ap an absolute epidemic in our world. So-called, all this so-called progress and everything going on, and yet inside we're feeling empty, it's sort of meaningless, what's all the purpose of all this? And you know, in psychology, depression is like a sadness that my dream in life to be loved and valued hasn't happened. But in spirituality, depression is like a mourning for the loss of my true identity. I'm living my life, but who am I really? Who am I deeply? And this is why spirituality really starts to first say, take responsibility for your emotions. Don't project them on anyone. And secondly, go deep into understanding who I am. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would say there's three personalities inside all of us. Two of them really contribute to these powerful emotions where I feel a victim of my emotions. One of these personalities starts to help me deal with my powerful emotions. And I would say that the first personality I call the eye of arrogance or the eye of superiority. This eye, this personality takes its whole identity from all the labels of my body. Who am I? My gender, my nationality, my religion, my profession, my family, hundreds of labels. What's common to all those labels? They are all temporary. So my whole sense of identity is based on everything temporary. And fundamentally, when my ego rules my inner system, when my ego is dominant, I compare with others and I think, I am better, I know more, I am right. It's not even conscious, the way I think, the way I see life, I'm right. But when it comes into my feelings, when my inner world is dominated by my ego, that's when I feel so easily insulted, disrespected, not valued, excluded, sensitive. Anyone sensitive here? I think we're all a bit sensitive. <laughs> Is that true? Have you ever been surprised how not even sensitive, you can be hypersensitive? <coughs> the tiniest little word or something can really affect you deeply. We've lost our spiritual power. And really, when I'm in feeling insulted, disrespected, not valued, my emotions run absolutely wild. But what is the seed of all this negative emotion? I have a false sense of who I am. 
I'm under a, an influence, a false influence. I, I know I will tell everybody I'm a soul, I'm the atma, but I still think I'm a body. I identify with my body. And that then is the parent of so much negative emotion based on my ego. But actually that first personality is a front for my second personality, which I call the I of inferiority or the I of lack of self-respect. And this personality also takes this <coughs> whole sense of identity from my temporary body, all the labels. And uh, this one compares with others, but thinks others are better. Others know more. Others don't love me. Others don't value me. Others don't respect me. And when this lack of self-respect comes into my feelings, that's when sometimes I feel hopeless about myself, inadequate, unworthy, not good enough. I would say depressed. And <coughs> so when my lack of self-respect is there, this, this second sense of identity, it also creates all these emotions, these powerful feelings of depression and sadness and all these sorts of feelings. So what happens? I fluctuate. One day I'm up, the next day I'm down. One hour I'm up, the next hour I'm down. It's an exhausting life. What we learn here is the third eye, because those first two eyes are the seeds of so much negative emotion. But the third I is the original I. I am the soul. The soul is a wonder. The soul exists, but it has no length, width, or breadth. The soul is just a point. In mathematics, a point exists, no length, breadth, or width. The soul is so subtle. I was sharing just <coughs> here today that some scientists now tell us that this body has 30 trillion cells. It's incredible, isn't it? I never know how they count them, but I don't think it matters. Just think a lot of cells. <laughs> and the soul is more subtle than one cell. Just think, who am I? Who am I? And when I start to go deeply into the idea of who I am, I come home to a place, my own experience, where you feel so settled, so stable, so calm, so peaceful. It's like you take all the pressure off yourself to be something, to live up to an image. You take all the expectations off yourself and you really start to reconnect with your fundamental self. So when I start to reconnect with the truth of who I am, automatically that seed starts to grow the plant of positive emotion. I'm more peaceful, I'm more loving, I'm more light. <coughs> and sometimes I think my inner world is like a tree. A tree has a seed, a trunk, branches and leaves. Your thoughts are the leaves. You see a big tree, how many leaves are on a big tree? Lacks, hundreds of thousands of leaves on a big tree. So often our mind, we think, 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 think too much. But what's feeding the, the, the leaves is the branches, my mental and emotional patterns. And what's feeding the branches is the trunk, my subconscious. Freud said that most 90% of our behavior is influenced by the programming in my subconscious. But what's feeding the trunk is the seed, my sense of identity. When the whole seed of my inner world is false, I think I'm the temporary body. That's who I am. I'm an Australian. I'm a male. I'm this. I'm that. That's all temporary. When that it grows a false trunk, a false branches, too many leaves and so much emotion all on the top. What are we doing here? We're putting a new seed, a seed of the truth that I am the soul. We know it. And we believe it, but we don't experience it. This is what Raj Yoga is about, is converting what I know. So I begin to live in a soul conscious state. It affects my subconscious. It affects the branches, my mental emotional patterns. 
my whole thoughts cool down, calm down. I'm still aware, I'm still accurate, I'm still alert, but I feel calm and cool inside. So I don't overreact with emotion. And so really I would say that second step is really knowing who I am, experiencing who I am. So I feel that it's not that I try to fight my anger or fight my fear, you know. What I need to do is re-emerge my peace. The more I taste who I am, the automatic byproduct is this incredible feeling of peace. The more peace, the less anger and other emotions have power. So it's like a positive approach. The more I step into peace, the power of anger has less and less effect on me. And sometimes I think, you know, I ask people, what's the aim of meditation? Most people say to be peaceful. And I say, no, that's the result. The aim of meditation is to know and experience who I am. And the automatic byproduct is you calm down. My own life, I'm a daily meditator, as she said, for nearly 50 years. My mind has completely changed, you know, from an overactive mind. I've noticed it just cool down, cool down. And not just when you meditate, and when you practice and practice, that becomes a part of who you are, even during your day. So these emotions are very powerful things, and we know, easy to say, the reason is that when we go deep into the soul, who am I? The soul is an overname for three faculties. The mind, which is thinking and feeling. <coughs> the intellect, which is judging. As I'm speaking, a part of you is assessing everything I say. You're saying, I like that, I don't like that, I agree with that, I don't agree with that. You know that part of you, that's your intellect. Then when we make a judgment, we do an action. And as you know, recorded in each one of us sitting in this room is my entire past in the form of my sanskaras. They are all laid out in my memory track, my whole past. And in a way, sometimes emotions are like little packages stored in my subconscious, in my memory track. The emotion of something happening, I just feel really down, I feel really low or something happening and I feel, you know, really upset by things or really angry. So these little packages of emotion, when life happens, someone says something and it triggers that little package, it flows into my mind, I get really upset. And then later I think, that was such a small thing. And I got so disturbed by such a baby thing because these are the habits I have stored in my memory track. And this is why meditation not only calms me down in the present, the aim of meditation is to start to clean these little packages of emotions stored in my memory track. I start to clean them out so that I refresh myself and restore myself to my real strength. I would say... The third thing is to experience true love. And a powerful emotion is grief. A very powerful emotion is grief. And there was a, an American psychiatrist <coughs> called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was a very interesting person. She would tour the world talking about grief. And she said, we all have grief stored inside of us, like a wound. And sometimes when a little thing happens in life, a little loss, maybe a little loss of wealth or a loss of a job or something like this, it opens up this incredible wound of sadness and grief, I would say. And what she said is that this wound, the original wound, is the loss of perfect love. I've known perfect love. And in fact, I have known and experienced a perfect love of God. But somewhere I lost that love. And so whenever I lose a relative, I lose something in my life, it opens up this deep wound that somewhere I've known this perfection of love. 
And this is why, for me, my journey with meditation has really been to learn how not just to know and not just to have faith in God, but to learn how to have a real living relationship with God. And for me, I experience that I'm a soul. You can see me sitting here. I'm expressing. I'm speaking, right? You can see me expressing through my body. God, I would say the supreme soul, is also a soul, but does not have sense organs. So we can't see, we can't hear. But an absolutely pure soul, a divine soul, a soul that's never influenced. And in a sense, meditation is linking myself with this soul that is unlimited in love, unlimited in peace, unlimited in purity, unlimited in power. It's a real living relationship. I'm not just sitting believing in a concept, believing in this intellectual idea, or believing in some, having just faith, like often we do in religion. I'm actually communicating and having a real living relationship with a conscious being, but a highest being and actually the most lovable being. And this is really, I would say, my own experience is that when I learn to become soul conscious, meaning I let go the consciousness of my body. I really am sitting here as the soul. I look through my third eye, I see, I touch, I connect with God, a real living connection. And I allow myself to be completely loved by God. You can't imagine the strength and the purity of that love, the quality of that love, is the most powerful healing power. It's not my imagination. It's absolutely real. I, the soul, in union with Paramatma, the Supreme Soul. And I find myself that when I sit, I wake up early in the morning. And what I love to do is sit <coughs> really so quietly and i become soul conscious, I sit in front of God and I allow myself to be totally loved. And I notice my whole inner world just cools down, calms down. It's like you feel you have everything you need. You don't need anything else. The first need in life is love. The first desire is love. When that desire is fully, totally satisfied, all other desires go. But if there's a lack of true love in life, all the desires emerge, the desire for power, desire for control, the desire for wealth, the desire for praise. Look at our materialistic world in which we live. Just so many desires because to me the reason is because of that lack, that real lack of that first experience of true love. And the way I sometimes think of it, it's like God or the Supreme Soul we often say Baba here, is on the FM wavelength. Completely always soul conscious. When I am body conscious, when I, the soul, am absorbed in the ego of this body, I'm on the AM wavelength. I can believe in God. <coughs> I can pray to God. But I don't really connect with God. That's what religion is. So what do I need to do? I need to move up to the FM wavelength. In other words... The more I become soul conscious, it's like I'm living in God's world. And that love becomes something absolutely real that I can experience in my life. You can't underestimate the power that gives you to not be a victim of your own emotion. Often we, we get angry, we feel down, and we just say, what can I do? I just feel I'm a victim. I'm like a puppet dancing to the tune of my emotions. And as a result, it damages my relationship with me. I don't like myself being like that, but I can't think, how can I change? The more I connect with the divine, it's almost like I get this internal power, this internal strength <coughs> to really not fall victim of my emotion. 
and remain, you know, much more peaceful and much more calm and relaxed. And so rather than my mind just sometimes feeling angry, sometimes feeling depressed, sometimes feeling sad and grief-stricken, sometimes feeling so sensitive and hurt, so life is just this incredible roller coaster. With love and wisdom, I take back the authority of my life by fundamentally redeveloping the relationship with myself as the soul. It takes practice. It does take practice. This is the spiritual journey. And redeveloping my relationship with God, my relationship with the divine. And I often feel when I put down these two anchors in my life, the anchors of my life are knowing and living as a soul, and knowing and living with the lover of the soul, this relationship with God, no matter how much this world changes around me, no matter how much people change, and people one day they like you, the next day they don't, no matter how many changes in the workplace, in the economy, I've built a solid foundation in my life. So life isn't constantly knocking me over. And I've, I let go this anxiety, what will happen? What's going to happen if, you know, the economy changes, if my job goes, if, you know, if a family member's health gets worse? We're just, we can't enjoy the present because there's so much anxiety. You know, anxiety is absolutely exponential in the world. Really, I would say that a lot of us in life have a love for spirituality and meditation, but we put it last on the list of things that are important. You know, <clears throat> always first is the family and the work and the this and the that. I put myself last. And what happens is sometimes I'm not a very pleasant person to live with. I'm not a very pleasant person to work with because, you know, I put myself last. And I find that many times what I'm noticing we start something like this, like a hobby. We come on Sunday night for a talk. That's good. <laughs> but, you know, we need, it's, we need a little bit more. So many people then start meditation like a discipline, like you do exercise. So morning and night I meditate. But what I find is you meditate, you relax a bit. As soon as you stop meditating, your mind reverts to your old thinking. You go back to your old thinking, your old attitudes. But what is working? What I notice in Australia now is so many people take this up as a lifestyle. That means I make a decision in my life that I am going to live as a peaceful soul. That's who I am. I'm not just going to meditate for a few minutes in the morning and then change. I'm going to step into the workplace. I'm going to step into the family and practice and carry this awareness of who I am and my relationship. You'll be absolutely amazed how much internal strength you get and how much you begin to change. Life becomes so much more enjoyable. And especially when you're not overreacting to the people you love. Because sometimes when we you know, we really react to the people we love, how do you feel about yourself? We don't really like ourselves. I feel our world is so uncertain at the moment, really. Nothing is really certain in our world. Unless I build those two anchors in my life, life's keeping will keep knocking me over, knocking me down, and my emotions will get stronger and stronger. <clears throat> and this is why really investment in me and investment in the quality of my thinking is something which is really important. So I'm going to take a signal for the thunder, from the thunder, and stop now. <laughs> Perhaps the thunder was telling me you've said enough now. So as I said, um, if anyone would like to ask something, you're most welcome. And then in a few minutes, we'll have a little bit of meditation. So please feel free if you'd like to ask a question, you're most welcome. See, when you are uh, explaining about emotions, multiple uh, questions or thoughts are going through my mind. And all of we undergo a lot of emotions. And the emotions, what I understand from you is, one is uh, impacting our own body 
and second thing is once these emotions are just flown out they are impacting others so i'm just wondering how do i aware at this moment i am undergoing this anger or a particular emotion if i know at a particular moment then how to control it and another thought that was going through is first of all where these emotions are sitting in the body sorry where these emotions are inside the body from heart so are <clears throat> in which part of the body and you know how do we aware and how do we control so mm-hmm. these are the certain thoughts that are going through yeah yes. <clears throat> thank you um you know the f- the first part of the the question was um the first part if you can just remind me i'm sorry the so, just so, so that many moment. so many uh, where how do i aware that at this moment i am in anger yeah you know i think that um anger is so quick right just like that anger is triggered and that's why it's um a little bit like health sometimes doctors say, talk about preventative health that if i exercise i eat well it's less chance i'm going to get sick the same way that when i meditate i remain more calm and peaceful the that instant thing has less and less effect because the more i remain peaceful but i think the main thing is that the seed of lot of my anger is that you are the problem it's your behavior that's triggering now intellectually we sort of know that actually it's me it's my reaction to you which is the problem if someone behaves badly someone's rude and i get upset what upset me was it their behavior or my reaction to their behavior it's my reaction so i'm the one making myself angry and when that <coughs> thought is so deep in me you'll find almost automatically you won't react so quickly but it's a deep deep habit over a long time and that's where we need patience in this journey of self transformation daddy jenki who was the head of the brahma kumaris did anyone meet daddy jenki here a few <coughs> she died just a few years ago you know she said i heard her say a few times you need three things on the spiritual path the first is patience the second is patience and guess what the third one was <laughs> you need a lot of patience with yourself to change in that way and so you know i would say that the the programming of that instant reaction but also it's very deep because as you start to know yourself more my learning for myself for many years was only my ego accepts sorrow so when i'm feeling hurt disrespected insulted not appreciated no the false self is ruling my inner world i'm under an illusion i am not self aware i am not so conscious i'm under a false state now we're all under that state because that's the culture of the world at the moment but the more you practice to be so conscious automatically you'll find when you're really so conscious even if someone insults you disrespects you you don't feel it because you, the ego has less and less power over me the ego is not going to accept that disrespect and hit back and feel insulted in that way so i'm afraid i'm <coughs> my memory is a bit short tonight <laughs> the second part was <laughs> i remember the second part when i asked the first part but now i've forgotten again <laughs> even i forget now <laughs> <laughs> so we have general amnesia here tonight <laughs> where is it your question is how to control the thoughts no hmm? no where these emotions are sitting in the body yeah they don't sit in the body they they sit in the soul like i said there's three aspects of consciousness the conscious mind the mind is like a screen so all the information from your senses what you hear what you see what you taste is thrown up on the screen 
the intellect is watching all that information and in an, almost an instant, according to the information and according to the mood of the intellect, the past, I make a decision and I may react and get angry and then I create a sanskara and the more I react, I create this little package which is stored in my subconscious. And this is why even when your mind says, I shouldn't get angry, I get very angry. Because it's like the habit is recorded in your subconscious that whenever anyone says this or behaves this way, it triggers a feeling inside me. And so, but there's no doubt the, the emotions in the soul affect the body. And this is why psychosomatic medicine is telling us that when I'm regularly angry, I'm regularly depressed. I'm regularly, <coughs> you know, having these power fearful. It has long-term effect on my heart and on my well-being. Investment in my spiritual progress is investment in my health, and I would say in my family and relationships too. When I change, everything around me changes for the better. And this is why really we're in a world where everything is superficial. We live in such a superficial world. We want run around making money and getting jobs, but I'm not happy inside. And I don't give time to make myself feel happy. What's more important is to invest time to understand who I am, how to find peace, how to find happiness. And so when I move around in my work and my family, I'm a much more fulfilled human being. And this is why really we need balance in life. I need time for my family, time for work, but I need time for me. That's not selfish. The more I'm happy, I'm gonna be a much nicer person in the home and a much better colleague in the workplace. It needs, I need to give time to myself. This is so important in this contemporary world. Because unfortunately, you know, <clears throat> I remember once in Australia I gave a meditation course to a billionaire. And you know what he said to me? He said, I'm a complete success out there and a total failure in here, inside. I said, why? He said, I'm not happy. And often we think this, these people that just make these millions and all this, they're not happy. I've given so many meditation courses in many countries of the world to leaders and people. They're not happy people. But somehow we feel that's what I'm running towards, you know, accumulate wealth, accumulate an image, get name and fame. It is not really as we all know, actually. But sometimes we find out we're caught in this culture of this sort of lifestyle. The time is telling all of us, give time to spirituality. Give time to know who I am. And most important, how to develop a loving relationship with God. There's no greater power in life than a really deep, loving relationship with God. So is there anyone else who'd like to ask something? Sir, I want to ask one question. How to control them? How to, how to control negative emotions when I control my heart and mind also, but I am not control my negative emotions when I get result-oriented programs in you. I think as we've been saying tonight that sometimes we try to control the thoughts at the top of the tree. So you control a few thoughts and ten more grow. You control one motion and ten more emotions appear. You've got to go to the seed of the tree. What's feeding the thoughts? Fundamentally, it's my sense of who I am. And because I've sown the false, the seed of my whole inner world is false, that I'm a temporary body. That is completely false. And hence, we have so much fear of death. and so This is all based on ignorance, fundamentally. I am an eternal soul. And when I sow that seed of truth and not just know it and believe, I experience it. I live in the state that I'm an eternal, immortal, non-physical, conscious soul. Automatically that influences 
you'll feel your thoughts cool down, your thoughts are less reactive, your emotions are less reactive. So rather than try to start up the top, go to the seed of the problem. The seed of the problem is this, I would say, body consciousness. <laughs> that means my whole thinking is distorted, all my judgments are distorted by ego, dependence, fear, greed, all these things are distorting my perception of life and triggering all my old emotions. It takes practice. And that's where I was saying that really if we just decide, what in Australia you saw the retreat centers, maybe some of you are watching, we have four. We always say to people that just practice for three months on a daily basis. Practice meditating, practice attitudes at work, practice seeing other people as souls. Just keep practicing and observe how it improves the quality of your life. Yes, please. There's a person. Thanks for the kind words. In your uh, five decades of journey, have you ever met someone who is able to manage the emotions but doesn't do the right thing? As in, uh, one is like uh, being soul conscious but doing the wrong thing. The practice is wrong. Do such people exist that they are soul conscious but they are not doing the right thing for society, the values are not in place, but they are in control. So one is like, yeah, as in being virtuous, yeah. I've never met such a person. <laughs> because I would say that <coughs> automatically when you're soul conscious, in a sense it's, soul consciousness means I have all my self-respect. Soul consciousness means my values are intact. And you know when you're soul conscious, you're very humble. It's, you know the natural expression of someone who's in a knowledgeable state, they're very humble. And so they will treat people with a lot of gentleness, kindness, respect, forgiveness, compassion. So no, I haven't met such a person. I've never had an interesting question like that before, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> Hello, I am Samir. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, how do we can control a family emotions, especially between a wife and mother-in-law? Mother. <laughs> so, uh, if we react, uh, this is, you're overreacting on it. If we don't react, you're not reacting at all. So, how do we, how do we can control this? <coughs> how do we manage between both the things? We're getting daily sandwiches between like this. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure I'm an expert with mother-in-laws, I'm afraid. <laughs> but you know, you'd be absolutely amazed that, um, you know, the way we're programmed now is that all my subconscious packages of emotion are like little buttons inside. And because I have no power, spiritual power, when someone behaves in a certain way, it just presses my button, presses my button. And I keep reacting, and the relationship gets worse and worse and worse. I think I can't change the other person, but I can change my reaction to the other person. It does take time. The more you practice soul consciousness, but also when you see that your mother-in-law is also a soul, I feel personally, when I really think about this, that I would say everyone in life today is struggling a bit. Life isn't easy for anybody. Most people are really struggling with self-doubt, self-criticism, fear about the future, and worry. And when you sort of look that your mother-in-law, <coughs> she's been brought up in a certain way, she, according to her value system, this should be done or this shouldn't be done. And in a way, I have to have that sort of respect and compassion. But what I found is that the more you become soul conscious, you become detached and loving. Detached doesn't mean you become aloof, withdrawn, not at all. It's the opposite. You're uninfluenced by other people and their feelings and emotions. 
So you can remain loving and kind to people even under the influence of their own nature. Because it's possible. Now, I am talking that it takes practice to be like that. But personally, I found of all the years of practice that I feel far less influenced by people and their nature and what they expect of you and how they project on you, all that sort of thing. And to be, detachment means to be very loving, very caring, very sweet, very kind, but uninfluenced by and this is a, like a spiritual purity you develop when you practice meditation. And it's a great power when you're not, you know, often I feel when we're body conscious, we absorb everything from people. When we're soul conscious, we observe. It's a big difference rather than absorbing. You know, I often think the mind is like a vacuum cleaner today because we're empty. If you give me love, if you give me respect, but if you insult me, if you disrespect, I take in everything. I take in the love, I take in the respect, but I take the insults, I take it, and then I blame you for it. This is the culture of body consciousness. The culture of soul consciousness is that, no, I am responsible for how I feel. I'm not going to accept the insult or the disrespect in that way. Really, it sounds like, oh, wow, that's hard to do. I know but it, it actually is possible. If you regularly practice, especially the connection with God, when it's not just a belief, like a devotional belief, but a real connection, the internal willpower and determination and strength you get, you'll be amazed how you can not overreact towards people. And, you know, really you feel so much better about the person you are because when you react to people close to you, Deep down, we feel bad about who we are. I would, if I can say, try a regular practice of meditation and see how you go. I am, I'm sure you'll feel transformation and it'll improve your relationship with your mother-in-law. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's another strategy for you. <laughs> Om Shanti. Yeah, yeah it, it's been an excellent session. I think it was a lot of learning and refreshing. Uh, as you were mentioning, so we get into a meditative modes, practice morning, evening. So definitely the connection happens and definitely you can see it is working. But in this uh, world, no family, workplace, all surroundings, so we get back to that. So probably we practice for about half an hour, one hour in the morning, evening. But remaining 20, 18, 20 hours, you're outside. The disconnection happens. But I think the secret sauce is how to get connected even for 24 hours. So, yeah, a lot of uh, people seem to be practicing and doing that. What is your advice for that to be in that state and continuing the routine? You know, I would say Thank for you. me, Meditation is not something you do morning and night. It's an attitude to life. It's, it's an attitude to life. It's like a decision you make. I'm going to live as a peaceful soul. For me, you, you meditate in the morning and it's like you create an atmosphere in your mind. But throughout the whole day, I'm paying attention to practicing soul conscious. I'm, it's not that I finish meditation. That's why I was saying... A lot of people meditate like a discipline. They meditate, and then the second they finish, their mind just reverts to their old thinking. So it's helping temporarily, but not much. When it's a lifestyle, you every day you're practicing to be a soul, remember God, and see others as souls. And the more you do that, you will sustain yourself 
throughout the day. And it's, it's practice, it's honestly practice. That's what I do personally. The, the point is, okay, if I continue to do it for a one hour, I'm in that state. But once I switch, the forces pull. Uh, so that I'm, my, my question was, how to be in that meditative state even while you are doing other things, you know? Yeah, that's what... Yeah, I mean, this is what we learn here in the Brahma Kumaris. We are karma yogis. We just don't... That's why I said meditation is an attitude to life. You don't just stop meditating. You carry on the awareness. When you sit, you, you have that full focus. But as you drive your car, as you walk down the street, as you go into a meeting, you are practicing who you are and how to connect. The more you practice, then the old emotions don't, they will come, but less. And after all, they have less effect on you. They'll come less and then they have less effect. And so slowly, slowly, I take back the authority of my life. This is why a daily hourly practice is required. And it's enjoyable. It's a challenge to the self. <coughs> I find the more you have this inner practice, you, it's like you're learning about yourself. You're observing what makes you a little bit irritated and you learn, no, I'm going to be doing, I'll do it differently next time. So you're, you're really building your understanding of how to live in this world, remain soul conscious. So it's really what we learn here is a constant, all my waking hours, I am practicing. And I often feel when people feel their meditation isn't good, some people say, I don't meditate well. It's not when you sit to meditate, it's the other 18 hours of the day. When you gossip a bit, when you get a little bit irritated and angry, those actions disturb your mind. You can't remember God. And this is why you start to learn that if I really want good meditation, I've got to have good behavior. The good behavior improves my meditation. And when my meditation improves, my behavior improves too. Your actions affect your mind. Some people meditate in the morning, then during the day they're angry, they're rude, they're aggressive. It'll never work. It'll never work. So this is why we follow here certain lifestyle things so that my actions, my behavior doesn't disturb my mind. So that... Like if, I, if I'm negative during the day and critical of people, reacting to people, putting people down, gossiping, you can't meditate. When you sit at night, you can't meditate because your actions are disturbing. So as if you really want to improve, you start to realize I've got to also have quality actions. They free my mind to have quality thoughts. The more quality thoughts you have, the power to do better actions. So it's like you're building yourself up. But... Daddy Jenki, once again, it needs Thank you. patience, patience, and <laughs> you really need a lot of patience. That's where I would continue. Anyway, I think we should probably finish. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think we're already over time. Oh, okay. So that will be the last question? Yeah. Okay. Apart from, of course, Raj Yoga. Um, you know, I know in Australia, most of the schools teach children to meditate. Most. It's just so common these days. But I would say the main thing, if you do it, your children will learn from you. You know, because a lot of parents think, oh, I wish my children could learn this get less emotionally reactive. If I meditate regularly and I really become stable, that is the most powerful influence and message to your children. Really, you know, my own sister often says to me that when she has two sons, that when she's really relaxed, she sees it influences them, but when she also gets a little bit stressed, that influences them. <coughs> children don't listen so much to what you say, as everyone knows today. They observe who you are. They will mimic who you are as a person. So when they see you non-reactive, 
you not getting angry, they will follow you mostly. So I would say the first step to helping your children is to really do it well yourself. And I think the greatest gift to a child is to really change myself because we are the role model that they will learn from automatically in a sense. But in saying that still, there's so many good programs. There's a whole series of cassettes that the Brahma Kumaris have made in the UK called Relax Kids, which is all about meditation and learning for children about spirituality. Very, very good stuff. I think it's on the internet. It's called Relax Kids. Yeah. Thank you. So let's just have a little bit of meditation. Can I make a suggestion, which perhaps you always do anyway, <clears throat> is to keep your eyes open. Gently rest your vision to the image of the Supreme Soul behind me, just naturally, and I'm just going to offer a few a few thoughts. <clears throat> Let me sit. Calmly and quietly and reflect deeply. How much am I still a victim of my powerful emotions? To begin the journey of taking back the authority of my life and my feelings. I need to know and experience who I am. Visualize yourself as the minute spark of life energy sitting lightly in the forehead. Just visualize this image of this tiny spark of consciousness. This is I, the soul. I've lived before this body and I will continue after this body. The more I taste the reality of who I am as a soul, I emerge peace. I emerge stability. I emerge love. And in this state of soul consciousness, visualize the form of God the eternal form of God as a radiant jewel of light. This is not just a belief or an image, but a conscious living being. This is the only relationship of life that is permanent. Through the eye of the mind, I connect with God as the ocean of love. Just feel the vibrations of pure love, divine love, true love emanating from the divine. And feel them entering the core of my being. 
Just keep your mind focused. Just feel this divine flow, fountain of pure love filling me and healing me. The more I taste this pure love, automatically the power of old emotion reduces and the power of my original self increases. To have self-love, to have good wishes for others, to have benevolent feelings, to give respect. I regain my inner power to be the person I would like to be. If each day I wake and before I think about yesterday or what I have to do today, I sit quietly. I become so conscious and I remember my beloved. The more I practice, the stronger I become. And the less power old emotions will have over me. To meditate regularly is an act of love for myself. To meditate regularly is an act of love for myself. Om Shanti. Such a wonderful experiential talk. So we thank from the bottom of our hearts for this time and applaud for your presence. Thank you.